Trinidad and Tobago on Twitter. Our call sign is at TT Parliament. Good afternoon, everyone, and I welcome the officials of the Ministry of Public Utilities, the members of the listening public, and the members of the media to this meeting of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee. The Committee on Public Administration and Appropriations has a mandate to consider and report to the House on A, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies to ensure that expenditure is embarked upon in accordance with parliamentary approval. B, the budgetary expenditure of government agencies as it occurs and keeps parliament informed of the implementation of the budget allocation. And C, the administration of government agencies to determine hindrances to their efficiency and to make recommendations to the government for improvement of public administration. The purpose of this 16th public meeting of the Public Administration and Appropriations Committee for the 11th Parliament is to follow up with the Ministry of Public Utilities with regard to the first and third reports of the committee. The first report of the PAC entailed an examination of the current expenditure of ministries and departments under three subheads, current transfers and subsidies, development program, consolidated fund, and Infrastructure Development Fund. The committee is desirous of hearing from the committee approximately one year later on the progress made in implementing the committee's recommendations, which were made following the examination of a number of issues, including fraudulent checks, inconsistent supply of electricity, and low public awareness of assistance programs. During the course of this inquiry, the committee also conducted a site visit to the Trinidad Generation Unlimited Power Plant, where the operations and maintenance of the plant was scrutinized. Additionally, the committee's third report encompassed an examination of the system of inventory control within the public service. The committee is hopeful that the ministry has made strides in maintaining its inventory register and tagging its inventory. Today, the committee intends to examine the ministry's statement of expenditure as of October 2017. This meeting is being held in public and will broadcast live on Parliament's Channel 11, Radio 105.5 FM, and the Parliament's YouTube channel, PalView. Viewers and listeners can send their comments related to today's inquiry via email at pal. 101 at ttparliament.org, facebook.com backstroke ttparliament, and Twitter at ttparliament. I now will invite the members and representatives of the Ministry of Public Utilities to introduce themselves. And might I start with Madam Deputy PS?
and may I just apologize, Mr. Pierce, I don't know. I didn't stretch my eyes well enough, um, and therefore I didn't intend any disrespect so that you can take over from here. Uh, my name is Gary Joseph, and I'm the Acting Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Public Utilities. Arlene Johnson Lawrence, Senior Project Manager, Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. I'm Anika Sarah Farmer, Director of Legal Services at the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon, Chair, and members of the committee. My name is Arlene Cullis, and I'm the Senior Economist in the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon. I am Caroline Babb. I'm the Acting Auditor Two at the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon, Marisha Pegas, Manager Customer Services, Ministry of Public Utilities. Hi, good afternoon, Ronald Roach, Chief Executive Officer, Trinidad and Tobago Solid Waste Management Company Limited. Thank you. Um, Ellis Boris, Chief Executive Officer of the Water and Sewage Authority. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin Ramsuk, General Manager, Trinidad and Tobago Electricity Commission. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I am George Alexis, the Acting Managing Director of the Trinidad and Tobago Postal Corporation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Marion Hayes, Director of Human Resource Service at the Ministry of Public Utilities. Good afternoon, Pamela Lachman, Accounting Executive One. very much and may I now ask the members of the committee to please introduce themselves starting from my extreme right Hi, I'm Jennifer Raful a member of the committee and independent senator Brigadier General Ansel Antoine MP member Wade Mark member Lakram Bodo vice chairman welcome good afternoon Ayana Webster Roy member Good afternoon, Ronald Huggins, member. And I am Bridget Anisa, George Chairman. Mr. Joseph, may I invite you to make a brief opening statement? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for your invitation to attend today's public hearing and also for the opportunity to give a brief opening statement. It is my hope that this introduction will give the members of this committee and the viewing public some context since our last appearance before you in May of 2016. The portfolio of the Ministry of Public Utilities and its agencies touches every conceivable aspect of our life in our Twin Island Republic. TNTEC is responsible for the transmission and distribution of electricity to residential, commercial, and industrial customers in Trinidad and in Tobago, in addition to that mandate, it is also responsible for power generation at the Cove power plant. WASA has a statutory mandate for the distribution of water and the management of wastewater throughout the country. SwimCall is the primary body responsible for solid waste management. TT Post is the state agency responsible for the postal sector. TSTT continues to be the primary telecommunications provider in Trinidad and Tobago. The RIC is the economic regulator for electricity, water, and wastewater sectors. And lastly, but certainly by no means least, the ministry has responsible for MTS, which provides security, training, maintenance, and other related services. In exercising its oversight functions over these agencies, the ministry's core mandate is to facilitate the effective delivery of efficient, affordable, and quality public utility services through a committed and resourceful team of professionals in close collaboration with all our stakeholders. Our ability, our ability to do so, however, would have been significantly affected by a number of factors, some of which I will now outline for you. I think that we are all aware of the old adage which states that the only constant in life is change. Without a doubt, the experience of the Ministry of Public Utilities and its agencies 
since May 11, 2016, when we last appeared before you, to the present date has brought a new dimension and meaning to that edit. Today, we, the management team of the Ministry of Public Utilities, stand before you representing a ministry and by extension a sector that has been through a period of transition. Over the last year, the utility sector would have experienced the appointment of no less than three ministers of public utilities, Ministers Antoine, Heinz, and Lehunt, the appointment of four permanent secretaries, Mr. Dan Paul, Sweet, Ms. Chitman, and now myself, the realignment of the CPEP Company Limited, reducing the complement of the ministry's portfolio from eight agencies to seven. Administrative changes in the agencies, which include the appointment of a new acting managing director at TT Post, the appointment of a new deputy executive director and executive director of the RIC, the appointment of a new CEO at WASA, and the appointment of a new chairman at TSTT. The most significant change during this period of transition, however, was the relocation of the Ministry of Public Utilities from its head office at number two Elizabeth Street, St. Clair, to its new home at number one Alexandra Place. On July 25, 2016, the Ministry was given a mandate to relocate to its new location on or before September 9, 2017. The Ministry, aided through the hard work of the staff, the benevolence of other ministries and agencies within the sector, and the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force accomplished this mammoth task in approximately seven weeks without receiving any additional financial resources to its allocation. The magnitude of such an exercise was definitely overshadowed by the current economic difficulties as the ministry was not able to show its appreciation to employees who literally worked wrong the clock and other benefactors who would have assisted the ministry free of charge. And so, Madam Chairman, I crave your indulgence to permit me the opportunity to thank the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force, TNTEC, WASA, MTS, and the Electrical Inspectorate Division, Ministry of Works and Transport, the Property and Real Estate Services Division of the Ministry of Public Administration and Communications, the staff of MPU, in particular the IT unit, administrative support services unit, the procurement unit, sectoral programs and project unit, and legal services division, who work tire tirelessly seven days a week during that period to complete this exercise. Of course, these events would have preceded my tenure at the ministry since I assumed the position of acting PS just over 10 weeks ago. Also, it should be noted that the Minister of Public Utilities, the Honorable Robert Lehunt, and the Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ms. Beverly Khan, have been at the ministry for just a bit over three months. So the senior executive team is relatively new. During that time, however, we have been involved in a number of activities, including preparations for Budget and Standing Finance Committee, our appearance before this committee today, the Ministry's appearance before the PAC, this morning with WASA, and the Ministry's appearance before the PAEC this morning with MTS. At this point, I would just say the Ministry is currently engaged in understanding what is taking place at the ground level. Additionally, we are currently involved in preparing the Ministry's work program and strategic plan. Based on my observations over the past 10 weeks, I have every confidence in the Ministry's capacity to fulfill its mandate. I have found the majority of the processes being implemented by the ministry to be sound. I have also found that the system of oversight with the agencies is for the most part robust. As with everything in life, there is always room for improvement. And in this regard, with the assistance of the DPS and other members of the team, we expanded upon the existing monitoring system and will be introducing a new performance uh, management framework for the agencies. Further, it is important to note that the performance management framework was heavily influenced by the, honor the Honorable Minister's priority areas of focus for the utility sector in fiscal 2018. These include debt management, operational efficiency, corporate governance, and enhanced customer service. 
Given the comprehensive nature of that framework and the strategies that are being implemented for the ministry's continued development, I have no doubt that together with the agencies on our, our purview, we'll continue to increase our capacity to better serve the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. Okay, so that my first question really, um, in terms of opening up our conversation, was to inquire into really your work program with respect to the significant reduction in your allocation. But I've heard that you're now in the process of preparing your, your work program. So if that's in fact so, when would your work program be prepared and completed? Uh, Madam Chair, we are hoping that within the next month we will have that completed. Uh, so that will lay the groundwork in terms of going forward. Okay, so that in terms of what would have occurred in the first three months of the current fiscal year, what would that have been guided by? Well, as you would appreciate, Madam Chair, uh, in terms of the first three months, that would have been in the fiscal 2018. And we would have prepared our budget estimates and so. So based on those estimates, certain activities, projects, et cetera, would have been aligned to the funding requirements. So we would have been guided by the activities listed, projects, et cetera, in the estimates. If, if you could give me an example of a project because my, I'm operating on the basis that your reduction in the budget, your actual what would have been approved would have been different from what your wish list would have been. And therefore, in going forward, even within the first three months, it would be very different on what your initial program was. So that, that's why I'm asking, what would have guided it? If your budget is considerably different, being reduced, how could it be guided by what you originally estimated? Sorry, what we would have to bear in mind, Madam Chair, is that even now, in terms of developing our work program, uh, it has to be anchored against something. So uh, in terms of the 2030, the development strategy would have been there. There would have been two particular themes that we would have been looking at, three and five. So some of our activities would have already been crafted around that. Some of our projects would be projects that are continuing into this fiscal. I think our challenge now as we face it is uh, it, it's certainly one of funding, because when we look at from October to now, our releases would have been primarily for salaries, wages, uh, traveling, and so. So you know, so we still challenge that way in terms of engaging in activities which would require the necessary funding from the Ministry of Finance. And in terms of, I just want to look back a bit at towards the end of last fiscal. Unfortunately, we thought the, um, your reports, your financial report for September and August, we thought they hadn't come. But we just realized that they've come. So that I want to really look, and maybe you could guide me from there. I want to look at, say, your report as of the 31st of July, 2017. You have that? The statement of actual cap capital expenditure. It starts with the DP. Yeah. 
Yes. Speaking of the one ending July? Yes. That, and, 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 because based on what you said, I, I understood that you would be carrying over projects mm -hmm. right. from last fiscal. You found it? DP July, yes. All right. So if I am looking at the development program, and, and as I say, you would have August and September with you, so you could guide me thereafter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking, say, for instance, at your national street lighting program, which is 581. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that your revised provision would have been a million dollars. Yes. Yes? Yes. All right. Um, so would I be correct in understanding that at the end of July 2017, you would have expended no money on that project and have no commitments on that project? That's true. Um, I will revert to our senior project manager. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I think that most of you, well, some of you who would have been here previously would be aware that with respect to the National Street Lighting Program mm -hmm. and the illumination projects, it is a situation where we have already released funds on hand at TN Tech. So although we are implementing works, it will not show up as an expenditure. Okay. All right, so we have not touched our allocation for that fiscal period, but it does not mean that we did not actually expend funds. All right, so could you give us an idea then of up to July what your expenditure would have been, even if it wouldn't for your current funds? All right, no problem. Um, for fiscal year 2017, we would have completed a total of 1,155 new and upgraded street lights, as well as um, 246 lamps installations were completed and we completed 494 polls at approximately $2.8 million. Okay. So that your allocation of a million dollars for fiscal 2017 would not have been touched at all? No. As you guys, all right, so that maybe then you could explain to us the variance of two million then. How does that come about? The variance of two And it's million? a positive variance. If you look at the capital expenditure budget 2017, month ending July 2017. The variance? Oh, well, what it simply meant is that um, the expectation was what we would have spent. At the beginning of the fiscal year, we would have had an allocation of $2 million. I don't know why it's a positive variance. It should probably be a negative variance. In that we did not expend any of the funds um, during the year. We did not project to expend any funds along here. Um, hmm. Interesting. But Madam Chair, what we'll have to do, we'll, we'll review this figure. Uh, uh, well, might I ask, uh, because all of these under E, Mm -hmm. if, if I understand it well, and, and, and that's why I've asked for assistance, I seem to see a difficulty that I can't understand and maybe you all could explain or help enlighten us. To me, the, everyone under A. Okay. So I shall start. Yes. Um, under the development of, under the National Street Lighting Program on hand at the beginning of the fiscal year, um, at the beginning of, or I should say, as at 1st October 2016, we would have had on hand just over 12 million, no, sorry, just over $10 million of already released funds. Mm -hmm. So that when we were implementing projects, we would have been utilizing funds that were already released to TN Tech. Right. Um, I just want to give an explanation where that is concerned. Um, probably what we would need to do as a ministry is to forward the approval. Um, back in September of 2014, um, TN Tech would have had funds on hand for various projects that would have come to an end meeting all of their deliverables. Mm -hmm. And there were excess funds. 
inclusive of the rural development or the rural electrification program that was funded by the EU. Permission would have been sought to reallocate that funding that was already on hand in TNTEC to various illumination projects, mm -hmm. as well as the bulk power project, which is code mm, development bulk power, which is A585. Um, funds would have been reallocated to A591. Funds would have been reallocated to Disaster Preparedness 583. So for the past several years, we have not been expending any funds under these line mm -hmm. items. We've been doing a reconciliation exercise on a monthly basis where when approvals are done, we meet with TN Tech and we cross check to ensure that the funds that are on hand, we can account for. And that is how we would have been doing it for the past three years. Mm -hmm. So although you don't see any movement in the expenditure, it is not that we're actually not accomplishing anything. Right. Yes. So I think what, we would, what I, we would agree to do is to provide you all with an update in terms of how the funds were reallocated, as well as what is our current balance against each of those line items. All right, thank you very much. So that therefore, Ms. Lawrence, as far as these statements that we've had, it means that none of these provisions have been touched. Correct, is right. All right, and therefore, your variance still needs to be reconciled, you know, in my understanding. Okay, so that Maybe what we would have to ask Tiantec to do, because I don't know if it occurs in the other areas, but certainly under 00305, it appears that we can't do much with what has been presented to us. Agreed. Okay, so that if this could be redone for July, August, September of 2017, Okay. okay. So apart from what you've undertaken to give us, mm -hmm. all right, if your statements, your expenditure statements could be redone. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that, and, and therefore I want to ask, let's just even just take 00305. Would I, would it therefore mean that for fiscal 2018, that you very likely still have unutilized funds on hand so that you don't have to touch your, your, your budgetary allocation? Only under the illumination projects. So that's only under 583, 585, and 591. So we are looking at 581. You would note that there was no allocation provided in 2018. Um, also on 592, new bulk power projects, no allocation was provided. Um, the electrification program, which is A593, no funds were provided. The, um, as a ministry, um, we did the responsible thing, where in terms of when we made our request in the draft estimates, if there were places that we knew we had funds on hand, we simply did not put forward for a request, although we would continue to be able to do works under the line. All right. Okay, so that... Certainly by the time you give us that, we'll be able to reconcile Absolutely. everything. Thank you very much. Okay, so I turn over to any member of the committee who may wish to ask a question. Member Mark? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Permanent Secretary? To the Chair. Um, could you just repeat for the record how many agencies would fall under the Ministry of Public Utilities. I, I have a note that you have submitted here and I am only seeing six of them. But I think you mentioned, is it seven or eight you mentioned? It's not making sense to me. 
because this is not the main top Was RIC listed there, Mama? You all are responsible for RIC as well? I thought that's an independent agency. For administrative reasons, uh, member, the RIC fall under the purview of the Ministry of Public Utilities. But yes, you are correct, it's an independent agency. Right, and apart from that, I have WASA, TNTEC, Solid Waste, Trinidad and Tobago Postal Corporation, TSTT, and MTS, along with the RIC. Is that all? Okay, right. Could you share with us what are the processes used by the ministry under your watch to properly monitor and evaluate the operations of these agencies? What, what system do you employ to ensure that, the, that these companies are not only accountable and exercise proper accountabilities, but also provide the country with value for money? How, how would you, as permanent secretary, go about monitoring and evaluating the performances of these agencies. Could you share with us? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, so in terms, of, in terms of the oversight, uh, there are a number of mechanisms in place to monitor what is taking place outside there. Uh, through the reporting relationships as it relates to reports and so on a monthly basis, reports are provided. Uh, there, on a quarterly basis, reports are provided. Annually, we have the audited financial statements, administrative reports. Uh, we also have the, st the strategic plan, which is aligned with uh, V2030. And in fact, we are going through some exercises now, and we are making sure that the plan is anchored to V2030. So in terms of reporting, there is that reporting mechanism in place. Uh, there is also a robust uh, system in place where we have a financial specialist on board at the ministry, and those financial reports that come to us, they are reviewed and analyzed by that specialist, and reports are subsequently submitted to the permanent secretary. If there's anything in there that warrants attention, it's brought to the attention of the PS, and I will then have or engage in conversation with probably the CEOs of those agencies. Uh, indicating there needs to be some remedial action to take place. Uh, so that's just from the reporting aspect of it. In terms of more monitoring of what takes place outside there, one has to appreciate that funds or subventions from the government go out to those agencies. So it's incumbent upon us to ensure that there's a strong framework to monitor what is taking place outside there. So, for example, at the projects unit, uh, after they would have submitted their work programs, we will have their projections, everything like that. The projects unit would strictly monitor the release of funds to those agencies. Uh, finance and accounts play a critical role in ensuring that those submissions are in accordance with what is required with the Exchequer and Audit Act, financial regulations and instructions, etc. So there is that financial framework again, to, which we need to ensure that uh, everything is in place. Uh, we also have our internal audit playing a role uh, when those submissions are made at a later date to review and ensure that everything uh, is up to speed and in accordance with the regulatory framework. We also have our m and &E units, which would look at the work programs, and there would be the assignments of performance targets, measurements, and so, and they will be reviewing that every quarter. If something is 
uh, going off if there's any slippages and so that would be brought to our attention and we will need to speak with the agencies. I think what is important as well is that what we have started is that um, before there would have been the meetings with the CEOs, which is done every two months. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, member, uh, due to the transition and the number of changes taking place in the ministry within the last year, some of those things fell to the wayside. So I think what is important for us as the new ex senior executive team is to ensure that we have certain building blocks in place that we could ensure that that monitoring takes place at a more consistent level. So we are working to put those things in place. So there are a number of mechanisms in place and we will continue to work with our line agencies to ensure that uh, they support what we are putting in place and to ensure that there's that regularity in terms of what we ask them to do. Do you hold um, regular meetings with these agencies so that you can, on a regular basis, have an appreciation of their overall operations and direction? Most certainly, Member. And as I hinted to a short while ago, um, the strategic plan is key to the direction that the organization goes forward with. And we, are, we have embarked on a process at the ministry. Uh, it's heavily championed by the minister because, as you will appreciate, conversations could be had at different levels. Uh, certainly the minister and the board, the PS and the CEOs. So we have, we have been having those conversations. I think what we started to look at is ensuring that those strategic plans are in, an align are in an alignment with the four strategic areas that we have identified, whether or not it's the operational efficiency, debt management, customer service, et cetera. Uh, so we are ensuring that there is that consistency and alignment with what we want to see happening in those sectors. And once, once that is structured within a strategic plan, that is what we're going to start to measure the organizations on. So everything stems from that strategic plan and alignment with the 2030 and what we have identified as our strategic priorities in going forward. Do you tell us whether if all of those agencies um, have and are guided by strategic plans and are these strategic plans um, current? We're talking about, is it seven or eight agencies? Do you know as permanent secretaries if those eight agencies all have strategic plans and whether those plans are current? Meaning for me, whether those plans are, we are now in 2017, do they have plans from 2016 to 2020, as an example? each of those agencies. Okay. So, Minister, uh, sorry, uh, Member, I know for sure at the Ministry we are currently engaged in conversations with our WASA and SwimCall in terms of reviewing their plans to ensure that there's that alignment with uh, our strategic focus. So those are two. Uh, TN Tech, I believe is, that strat plan is currently in place. Yes, yeah, that's correct. We have a plan from 2016 to 2021. And again, we are reviewing that plan as we move forward to the next fiscal period. Okay. Uh, MTS is current. MTS is also current. Uh, TSTT and RIC, they are also current. Uh, And I was just advised by TT Post they are working on a transformation plan at this point in time. A transformation plan is a little separate from a strategic plan, isn't it? Or yes. is, that, is that part of your strategic plan? Yes, Member, the transformation plan uh, is to lead into a new strategic plan. The strategic plan would have lapsed, and with a new board in place, we're looking at a transformation 
exercise, which will feed into the generation of a strategic plan. All right. I, I just want to ask the Permanent Secretary. Recently, there were reports in the media, and I'm dealing with WASA here, of persons not following established procedures in acquiring truck borne water. We understand from media reports that truck borne water was utilized for a bikini car wash in Arima. This is an area that is currently facing severe water shortages. Could you indicate to this committee what are the consequences, or what tangible consequences would be developed to treat with instances such as these? And as you're on that point, what is WASA putting in place to avoid, obviate situations like these in the future? Uh, member, I'm aware that investigations would have been undertaken, uh, but I would like to revert this to Dr. Boris at WASA. Thank you, PS yeah, okay, yeah. and Chair, Chair, Chairman. I, mm -hmm. I just want to indicate that WASA has uh, its regulations yeah. or its guidance policies with respect to water weaning with respect to truck borne water. That situation, the persons involved breach the, the arrangements and we have taken action on the two individuals they have been suspended, and uh, the report with respect to the investigation has just been submitted. Charge will be laid, and also uh, a tribunal will sit on the matter, will take the dis final disciplinary action on the individuals. It means that um, we have in place uh, the necessary procedures with respect to the winning of truck-borne water, which was breached, and uh, we are dealing with it effectively. Chairman, um, to the Secretary, Permanent Secretary, um, could you indicate to us whether there are established procedures for the distribution of um, truck borne water and what mechanisms, if there are established procedures in place, what mechanisms? exists to ensure that water that is needed for life is not diverted or wasted by those agencies or bodies that are responsible for distributing same to residents who are in dire need of water. May I ask the Permanent Secretary, and maybe you can uh, um, forward whatever response is true, the CEO of WASA. Yes, member, I will defer to Dr. Boris. I know there's a truck policy. Yes, the, the, policy, the, the, the policy that relates to um, truck borne water, the, the wheresoever WASA systems are, uh, are placed at the end, up to the end of the, our, our water network, we as what the Water and Sewage Authority takes precedent with respect to the delivery of water for persons who are living within the network. The outside of the network, the, the, the corporation, the regional corporations take care of those areas. And um, uh, for a, a customer to get water, they would um, apply or, or, or call in and then it will be checked on whether they are a valid customer, or there is a, uh, whether they are paying their water rates. That will be checked on. And then the, from the call center, we will send out the, the trucks to deliver the waters. So 
the occasion that um, took place, as I said, the, there's a procedure full in place that, and when you break the procedures, you will be dealt with accordingly. Madam Chair, Chairman, I'm looking on the Infrastructure Development Fund, and I'm looking at Southwest Sewerage Upgrade under the item 008. Through the Chair, to the Permanent Secretary and to Mr. Boris, could you advise this committee what is the status of this project as of July 31st, 2017. And could you further advise this committee or share with this committee the reasons for the increase in allocation for this project? And finally, under this particular item, on the Infrastructure Development Fund. When is this project scheduled to be completed? Yes, sir. I remember I'll ask our senior project manager to respond. Um, good afternoon, member. You queried the change in the allocation. No, I just want to make sure I got all the parts of the question. Well, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the decrease, but what I would say is um, Southwest Tobago sewage upgrade, um, that project is now considered has been included under F002, also under the IDF, which is the Wastewater Network Expansion, which is an IDB funded program. So that that would have been reflected there. So what would have been the previous allocation of $20 million is now, that entire project is now included under WON 2600, otherwise known as F002, Wastewater Network Expansion. At present, of that project is now at 41% complete. Um, lands were acquired at Salmon Grove. And those construction works have already been taking place. Um, the projects are due for delivery in, I just want to make sure I get it right, because I believe it's July 2018 on um, both sides. Um, the works on the Bonacord side will be commencing next week. I believe that the advance payment has been made or will be made this week, and the contractors will be on site for that area next week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just f a final question, Madam Chair. On the Infrastructure Development Fund again, on the multi-phase wastewater rehabilitation program 006, would you again, through the chair, want to share with us what is the status of this program as of July the 31st of this year? And there appears to have been some increases as well in this particular um, project. And could you tell us when the program is scheduled for completion? That is the multi-phase wastewater rehabilitation program yes. on the infrastructure development. Yes, through the chair. The multi-phase wastewater rehabilitation program includes three different components. The first component is the upgrade and rehabilitation of the San Fernando wastewater treatment plant. And that at this present time is 38% completed. The scheduled completion date for the entire activity is 2020. Um, the Malabar Wastewater Treatment Plant at this present time is 70, I apologize, is 87% complete. 
we expect to commission that grant in January of 2018. The third component is the corporate governance project and that the final report was received on the 1st of December by WASA. So that we expect that to, after going back and forth and reviewing, um, we expect that that component will come to a close in January. Okay, so Dr. Budu. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, P.S., this uh, question relates to a statement that was made by the Minister during the Standing Finance Committee um, and it refers to the street lighting program. And if I may just uh, read, it's, it says a system would be implemented to manage the lights that are left on in parks and recreational grounds. This program would be in partnership with TNTEC to automatically take off the lights at a particular period. Um, with regards to that, the, the issue being that there are many parks that the lights are left on at night when there is no activity. So with regards to that, can you perhaps update us on as to the status of this um, program? What's, what, what has been done and how far along we are? Okay. I would ask Mr. Ramsuk to update us. Right, afternoon again. So with regards to the recreation grounds, there are two issues. One, at present we operate the grounds within the period 6.30 to 9.30. And there is a switch that we have installed on the ground that allows, that, and that will, the ground themselves will not come on supply unless somebody pushes that switch to bring on the lights. And that's an energy saving method so that if somebody, and we would have normally, when we do openings of grounds, we identify somebody through the Member of Parliament who would normally keep the relevant keys or have access to that location that they could turn on the grounds. So that's one of the energy saving methods for the ground. Unfortunately, there are times when people still want to turn on the grounds, push the switch, turn on the ground within that period, um, just to have the lights on even though nobody's there on the grounds. Happens at times. But that switch though, when you operate that switch, it will not turn on the ground any, any period out of 9.30 or before 6.30, depending on how we set our timer. To answer your question though, we have gone out for tender to, to, to have what you call an automated system. And that automated system is going to see all the grounds the tender has already gone out, right? So, we are, so, so, so once we get back our replies and so on, it is looking at all the grounds, we will then establish if there are any presence of individuals in the ground and remotely we will be switching off the lights. So, so, so that tender has gone out and that again is to save energy um, for, for, for situations where the ground, there's no one in the ground, as you know the consumption on these grounds are quite high, all right, and the expectation is that we avoid, we, as best as possible if there are nobody utilizing the ground, right, that the ground could stay out Right, of course, and, and, and will be available once there, there's a need to use the ground. Thank you. Uh, I so expect, you, just to com sorry. complete the answer, I expect if all goes well, um, that system to be in place by the end of 2018, though. Thank you. That answers my, my next question. But I also wanted to refer to the minister's statement, which said the ministry would be engaging in energy conservation type activities. And of course, this is one that you just mentioned. Can you perhaps explain um, any other type of energy conservation that is being looked at, especially perhaps with regards to the lighting of public buildings, for example, and other such um, initiatives? Right, so yes, sir. Um, so our line minister, in fact, um, would have had a number, through the line ministry as well as through the P, with the PS, would have had a number of initiatives related to energy saving. And I, I would dare say that he is, is very passionate about that. And um, we, we at TNTech have started a number of projects. One of them is the LEDs, right? So we are moving away from what you call the high pressure sodium, which is more energy efficient lights. We have 1,000 that we are testing on the system. If you drive around the Queens Park Savannah, you will see them lit right around the entire Savannah, um, along BB Boulevard. Uh, we would have installed a number of those lights also. Um, 
the plan is to utilize them in key areas. Of course, the first thing is to observe how they perform, and that will deal with the, high, the, the LEDs and the transition right, from, from, from high-pressure sodium to LEDs, which is not only more efficient, but of course, um, in terms of, in terms of the, 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 the reliability, is much more reliable. In terms of the building, so our corporate communication person has started that initiative and we are getting across to the radio stations and so on. We are asking people, please conserve when it's not in use and that is not um, having building light on necessarily. And we intend to go back with an initiative with regards to trying to move people away from incandescent, right, uh, to compact fluorescent as well as LEDs. But LEDs are taking over um, now in the market and there'll be significant savings with LEDs once customers utilize LEDs. Can you, can you uh, indicate do, do you feel satisfied that enough public education has taken place with regards to the switch to LEDs from the traditional um, bulbs and so on that I use? Because I'm, I'm asking this because I'm not aware of any sure. you know, public education in that direction. So, no, so, so we have started the process to really elevate it much more now. I, 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 as I've said, we have had one or two radio programs, our corporate person goes into the station and I myself have heard the programs and we have done one or two ads and we intend you will see in the coming um, period of time you'll see more and more of that all right for the elevator as I said through the line ministry um, as I said through their initiative and in, in also in, in directing TN Tech in, in terms of moving in that direction right um, certainly you'll see more of that in, in, in time sir. And if I may just ask another question with regards to just the opposite problem which as a member of parliament I would face in terms of blown street lights and so on. Can you indicate whether there's a process or you know, a policy in place as to identification of these lights and um, the replacement of, of bulbs and so on, especially important in, in certain areas? Right, so we have a total of approximately 210,000 street lights installed, both Trinidad and Tobago. And of course you would have, um, as the, as for every year, that number has been increasing. Um, we at TN Tech are making every effort, given our resources, to attend to all the, 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 the failed lights. So we have switched um, by, by a board directive, and it is working much well, um, um, better now. We have switched into what you call a blitz arrangement. And that blitz is working very good. In fact, um, our records are showing that we are re responding to 5,000 lights per month. We anticipate about 30,000 fail lights. So by the time we get to it, it will be another seven months, right? But the, but the thing is, uh, but you know, this street lighting program started in 2006. So as you know, the, the lights themselves, with time, you're gonna have failures. So that, that's why I spoke about the LEDs, and that is why I'm saying also that the effort is being made to, to attend to all of them. At this stage, we have 11 crews that are involved in the process. And as I said, um, the, the Blitz is in fact making an impact. And we just ask them for the customers who are here, and I know it's a passionate issue outside there, just to bear with us. We're using the best in terms of our resources. I, I am telling you, in terms of how best we can do it, and we're trying to get to all the failed lights on the outside there. I hear you, but can you indicate as, as to whether there's something in place, some system in place to identify these lights, or do we just depend on customers filing a complaint? Right, yes, so, so okay, so, I suppose I don't know if anyone will ask about the call center system now, but, but yes, what we do is we do a lot of night surveys. So we have our personnel that go out there and they do the night surveys because the best time to pick it up is in the night, right? So we do the night surveys, we identify the work so that when, our, when we deploy our crews during the day, they're not going to do any trouble. They're going directly to where the issues are, right, to resolve, resolve the problems. Suppose that's, that's the answer I'm looking for. If I may, Madam Chair, just one more question. Um, PSU indicated in your opening statement that you are confident about the ministry's capacity to fulfill this mandate, and I applaud you on that confidence. But my question relates to the, the issue of leakage, um, of wasser leaks. And if I may just reference, for example, the leak that is occurring right outside the parliament here. Um, there's a, a leak in water hydrant that's been happening for several weeks. I'm just using that as a reference. But just to ask, um, again, with regards to the policy or the process that is, that is in place to detect these leaks and to fix these leaks.
Uh, before reverting to Dr. Boris, I think I would want to indicate that yes, this is a very significant area for us, given that over 230 million gallons of water are produced every day, and a significant amount of this, as Dr. Boris would indicate, uh, is involved in leakages. Our intention is going forward is to bring that amount to within uh, acceptable levels, possibly around 20 percent, as it were, because that tends to be the benchmark when we look at other jurisdictions. Uh, so yes, there is that commitment to go forward, uh, there's, there, but there has to be engagement with all the parties concerned, the workers, the union, in terms of shifting how we operate. So I will revert to Dr. Boris, and he could provide some more details on, on this initiative. Okay, thank you, P.S. and uh, Chair. Uh, it, the fact remains uh, hydrants are not under the Water and Sewage Authority. They are the uh, portfolio of the fire services. On the other hand, with respect to general leaks, uh, the Water and Sewage Authority is making an enthusiastic drive to ensure we bring down the number of leaks we have on our systems. And... Um, we have uh, uh, going to implement uh, some night shift work, and uh, uh, which we have already discussed with the union, and they have already agreed because we are working in a unionized environment. And uh, uh, we hope that we can capture the situation as rapidly as possible, so we can restore and reduce the the the, the level of, of percentage of leakage of our water. Yes, um, I, I take the point that the, the fire hydrants are under the fire services, but my point is that at the end of the day, it is still water that is leaking, and that, of course, will impact on WASA. So two questions. Um, are you satisfied that that is, are you happy that that is a satisfactory arrangement? And the second is, what is in place, for example, for that issue to be to be dealt with, I'm just I'm just citing that particular example right on Dock Road in front of the Parliament, for example. Uh, it it certainly is something that we could look at uh, in terms of what currently exists, as Dr. Boris indicated, that falls under the purview of the Fire Service. Uh, I am not sure if reports would have been made to the Fire Service. I'm not sure the response time, uh, but if it is that. It takes a very long time. I don't know if we could possibly look to see if that responsibility could. But it, it's something, I'm, I'm not aware exactly how it works, but it's something that we could seek to engage the fire service on. I don't mean to press on the point, but you see, as a medical practitioner, when I see water leaking, it's akin to blood leaking from a patient. And of course, we all know what happens. But I just want to ask one more question with regards to you said a significant, we produce 230 million gallons per day, and a significant amount is, is wasted. Do we have an idea of what that significant number is in terms of percentages? Can we provide that information? Or is that available as we speak? Uh, I will revert to Dr. Boris on this. Uh, from at least I, I am not sure as an engineer, I know that I like to deal with numbers from a very practical standpoint where we do measurements, etc. Uh, the systems that we have do not have the metering system to exactly give the information, but a statement is made when I join the authority that is approximately 43% to 50% of the water uh, suffering this situation with leakage. So we are trying to see how well we can bring down the percentage, as the PSA said uh, earlier. So the, sorry. Member, I, I may just want to add, uh, I will just ask our senior project manager just to add some more in terms of what we are doing. Um, through you, Chair, we recently received approval to include a new line item under the PSIP for um, water sources, and that will be, the name of the program is called Non-Revenue Water Reduction Program. Um, I think that you all would understand that people 
speak about non-revenue water, but not exactly understanding that it's not just the leaks that we are speaking about. It's not just leaks on mains, it's also leaks on service, um, on service con surface, sorry, service connections, as well as when people are inappropriately or incorrectly billed for the water they use, as well as people who are actually, you know, doing water larceny. Um, that program includes the establishment of a, a rapid response team in north, south, east, west, as well as two in Tobago, that they could rapidly respond to any leaks that um, they are notified about. It speaks to the replacement of 15 kilometers of high leakage mains, as well as the installation of both bulk and source metering so that we could get accurate numbers in terms of how much water is actually leaking out on the system. In addition to that, you will see, soon see the launch of Awasa app. It's in the testing phase, which gives um, the members of the public the opportunity to take pictures of leaks and where those leaks are, um, the GIS is going to map them and that information is going to go into WASA's system so that they could quickly respond to the repairs of the leaks. It also allows you to um, request a truck borne supply of water as well as get information on your billing. That app right now is in the testing phase within the Ministry of Public Utilities, so you will soon see a public launch where that app is concerned. Thank you. I, I look forward to your app because I have many pictures that I will be um, ready to upload for you on that app. And I also wanted to, to, to commend the fact that you're treating water wastage as a crime because you have a rapid response unit. So I, I thank you for that response. Okay. Member Huggins. To you, Madam Chair. Um, just a follow-up. What, what are some of the major causes of those leaks? I'll, I'll the senior project manager again. Um, the bulk of the leaks that we have on the system occur in the north of Trinidad, northwest of Trinidad. Um, one of the reasons that this happens is that the bulk of the population, 25% of the population lives in northwest Trinidad, as well as during the working day, more than 400,000 persons travel in this direction. But it is also one of the areas that has the least levels of water production in the area. So most of the water coming into Port of Spain comes from east, from Carony, et cetera. And therefore, we have to schedule. Every time they schedule, meaning turn water on, turn water off, the infrastructure is old, you get corrosion, you get air on the line, and this is what causes this amount of leaks continuously. Until we treat with that, there will be difficulty. So that's one of the reasons. So that a lot of the leaks, even if you look at the general number of leaks that they have on any given basis, more than 25% of them, a significant amount of those leaks will happen in Northwest Trinidad. Okay, in terms of uh, being more cost effective under the item program administration, the ministry identified that it hopes to implement some cost effective measures in terms of zoning contractors and purchasing materials in bulk and so forth. Um, has these cost effective measures been implemented? Public administration, program administration, sorry. In terms of that program administration, I think, believe that we are specifically referring to the UAP program as well as the REAP program. Program being implemented by the Sectoral Programs and Projects Unit of the Ministry of Public Utilities. Right, so that we're looking at the REAP project. The REAP project is one that speaks to house wiring and rewiring um, for those persons who are um, economically challenged as well as those persons who are on social disability. What happens is that um, we would contract persons to come in and do house wiring and it would include both labor and materials. One of the ways that we thought we would have been able to reduce some of the costs would have been to bulk buy the material, keep it on stock, and then just pay persons for labor. 
and we are working towards that, but at this point in time, we are really doing a review of the program to ensure that it's meeting its policy objectives. Given the, the current economic constraints, we are looking um, for many ways that we could reduce our overhead expenditure. Mr. Agatevene. One more question. In terms of your public awareness program, I know that in 2016, you would have done some, well, two events, one in Sandy Grandi and one somewhere else. Have any similar events been done in 2017, in terms of your awareness campaign, and where? I will revert to Ms. Pegas on this. Yes, good afternoon. In terms of the events that were held in Sandy Grandi and Point 14, we, the ministry would have led those events and would have been solely responsible for their hosting. However, over the period of fiscal 2017, we would have faced some economic constraints and with that, what we would have done is that we would have partnered with other agencies such as the regional corporations, the land settlement agency, the, the Ministry of Health and so forth in order to participate in events that they would have hosted. So over the period we have had 21 events where we would have gone out into various communities across Tuna Puna Regional Corporation, we would have gone to um, Toka Sandy Grandi, we would have gone back to Point Fourteen for other reasons. We have been right across the country in terms of participating in public education events. Yes. Okay. In terms of the solar panel assistance, I see you have a lot of initiatives here to do, a lot of promotional stuff. Is there any measured results in terms of the effect of the awareness programs? Has it yield any positive effect? Quantifiable, that is? Yes. Um, what we would have noticed, it would have been that whenever we do go out to these events, there would be a marked increase, say, for a period of two weeks in terms of interest in the various programs and also applications being received by the ministry. So I have noticed a number of um, changes in how the, how the public responds to these events, yes. So can you give us an idea of how many persons would have benefited from that program in so, 2017? Okay. As it pertains to the solar panel aspect of the UAP, we would have received over the period 62 applications to the program. The challenge, however, would be persons meeting the program criteria. So we would have had nine of those applications approved because you are required to have land tenure documents, need to meet the income criteria of the program and so forth. So we would have had nine of those persons meeting the criteria for the period. Yes. Could you therefore just hold your questions so that we could invite another member? Sure. All right, so might I ask Member Rafu? Thank you. Um, thank you all for answering the questions and for your service to Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I'm really curious to learn a bit more about the solar program as well as the other two assistance programs, the utility bill program and electrification assistance program. In particular, the solar panel program, the criteria for accessing it, and does the Ministry of Public Utilities work with the Ministry of Social Development or other ministries for um, identifying families that can benefit? Or is it a whole new set of criteria? How does it work? The criteria for benefit. I beg your pardon. <laughs> the criteria for, ben for benefiting under the solar panel 
assistance component of the UAP requires that persons have a monthly income of $6,000. This is quite similar to the beneficiaries under the Ministry of Social Development in terms of who they target. We have liaised with the ministry over the years, and there are times that persons would be referred from that ministry to the Ministry of Public, Public Utilities for assistance. Um, in terms of the, the other criteria, as I would have mentioned, they are required to have tenure documents because we are installing a solar panel system at the location. So yes, we have been lazing, and the criteria is somewhat similar. Sorry, did you say it was under 6,000 or over 6,000? 6,000. 6, and above? 6,000 and under, and yes. Okay. Um, and for other people who are, don't fill that criteria, they can just buy it on their own? <laughs> well, the program, as you could imagine, we do have a small budget for the program. So in targeting, we are, we are looking at ensuring that it's targeted to those persons who are unable to access the electricity grid. So it is not a program that is targeted to simply persons who would like a solar panel. It's really for those persons who cannot access TNTEC's electricity grid and, of course, cannot afford the um, acquiring the solar panel on their own, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a question for The Economist. Thanks. Um, I'm curious as to why the Ministry of, Public, Util of um, Public Utilities has an economist position while there's also the Regulated Industries Commission. Is there collaboration between the economist position and RIC, or is it that one is more of a data collection and the other one is more of a data analysis. Can you explain the relationship between the two? Good day, everyone. Excuse my, uh, the economist position is part of the economic um, policy planning division and research division. Um, there is some liaison that will occur, but <clears throat> the RIC, as we had already at the is an independent agency. So there is some collaboration, but it's very minimal. Yeah. <clears throat> um, in terms of the overall financing, the ministry receives an allocation of $2.8 billion. Is this um, exclusive of user fees, i.e. citizens paying for water and electricity, or is this um, including that from citizens. So what's the net expense or the net loss of the institutions in particular that are under the ministry? Um, it, it doesn't include those expenses that you're indicating. Uh, in terms of uh, their levels of expenditure and their operating profit, and so we may probably have to touch the individual agencies to get that information. Okay. But it does not. Yeah, that two point eight was the recurrent on our okay. recurrent. Side, yeah. So that was my follow up question. Of the two point eight, how much is recurrent and how much is capital? Well, overall recurrent is about two point eight billion. Mm -hmm. uh, and then our DP and IDF uh, that should be about 0.7 billion. So our total, uh, it, it's about 3.5 billion. Okay. Um, I'm a big fan of looking at technologies that allow citizens to take part in a greater way in providing their own utilities, um, such as solar panels and um, you know, grey water collection systems. Is there um, similar to the solar panel program to enable citizens to be able to produce their own electricity, is there a look at, is there um, um, an initiative looking at other technologies that can be used by citizens and tax incentives or rebates to allow citizens to um, be more informed about technologies that they can use themselves at home? and financial incentives to adopt such technologies. I, 
at present, there's, there's nothing that would allow for that. Uh, but certainly in going forward, we have to have that look ahead uh, in terms of working with the agencies to promote conservation, uh, renewable energies, and so uh, we have to look at that. I, I think being a forward-thinking ministry as it relates to energy and so what we want to do is to look at conservation within ministries mm -hmm. so we would want to push a policy where we try to reduce the electricity uh, we are also looking at uh, possible the possibility of utilizing for example solar panels in government buildings to bring down electricity costs we want to look at probably the construction of government buildings to make the buildings uh, more Green, green utilizing the green technology green. and so so mm -hmm. in going forward i think you know there are a number of things we could look at mm -hmm. so for example another area with electricity uh, it has not reached that stage yet but i would certainly have in my mind that's somewhere we want to go to uh so for example the installation of solar panels on your house mm -hmm. and it feeds back into the grid so you could earn money from that so that's something that we will have to look at with tn tech and see how when going forward that it could be mm -hmm. yeah so there are a number of things but i guess as as we go forward like i said it's it, it's just a few months we are there we're trying to get an idea of uh the current state as it were mm -hmm. and then certainly as uh our senior economist has indicated that she is in our research unit and they would be looking at different, rolling out different policies and so. And uh, one of our strategic priorities, like I said, we are still working on our work program, but one of our strategic priorities is promoting renewable technologies in the public utilities. So there has to be a vision in going forward. And certainly, uh, Trinidad, and, Trinidad and Tobago has to make more use of those um, non-renewable forms of energy. So we would want to push that. I'm really happy to hear that. Um, one follow-up question. Would it be the mandate of the Ministry of Public Utilities to go through with that rollout, or would it be Ministry of Planning? Would it be a an, an, uh, um, committee of different agencies taking the country further? And do you have any um, recommendations for how we can do it collaboratively as a country? Uh, Member, might I ask, I'd allow the first question. Uh, maybe we could get any recommendations in writing, but I would allow the, f the first question so that the context. Okay. I'm guided. Thank you. It certainly has to be a collaborative basis because it, it cuts across various ministries. Uh, so that's something we would need to ensure takes place. All right. Might I call on Member Webster Roy? Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is for the Ministry and SwimCal. What are some of the initiatives in trying to improve waste collection and management in Trinidad and Tobago? I will revert to Saroj. Good afternoon again. Uh, we do have a number of initiatives. Um, one, one of the things we're proud about is the, the pilot project that we started in the Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation. Uh, that has proven a success so far, um, given the constraints, uh, given, given there's a need for a, a complete culture change with respect to waste management. Um, but we're hopeful by that initial success, and it's our plan in working with the ministry to extend that to all of the uh, municipalities as pilots and then uh, to have uh, a complete uh, system of curbside collection throughout the country. Um, in addition to that, there's also the need to uh, change the cultures and we have in, embarked on, on a public education program. That program is um, based at a school level in the one instance, um, but we are also uh, trying to target the, um, the adult population. We have some short uh, documentary advertisements uh, happening in the cinemas now um, and we're using the opportunity now is a, is, is quite a blockbuster time. Um, at the cinemas, so we think that you know we have a captive audience there. Um, we're also working uh, along with our ministry in developing a recycling culture 
at the ministries themselves because the government needs to lead by example and, and we will soon have a launch of a um, recyclable uh, solid waste management project at the ministries. Um, and uh, we are collaborating with the Tobago House of Assembly as well to have an island-wide uh, recycling program there. Um, again, it's some constraints that we have to deal with, in particular um, the transport of the recyclable materials um, back to Trinidad for, uh, for further processing and so. Um, and once we overcome those, those challenges, we would have a program in, in Tobago. So the approach is, is multi-pronged, and uh, but you know there, there, there are mm -hmm. a number of initiatives that are happening right now that we expect to build on to have a nationwide culture of proper waste management and recycling to reduce the amount of waste that we, we generate as a country, as an island state. We generate far too much waste, and we need to be mindful of that. We need to educate the population about that, and, um, and we have begun that process. Follow up question. Um, the bulk of your waste, we we'll say, would be would it be plastic and um, plastic bottles? The weight is um, the waste is has been measured by weight, and and by weight, it's actually the bulk is is actually organic. So, um, so your food waste and your your tree and, and yard trimmings and so. Um, but visibly, yes, the, the plastics, because its plastic is, is light, so therefore a little bit of plastic occupies a large volume. So visibly, um, the plastics, in particular plastic bottles and styrofoam, represents the majority from a volume point of view. Um, and that's why one of the first things we did, in fact, um, try to address is the, is the, is the beverage container um, waste, which is, is very recyclable and, um, and you know, can sustain uh, proper recycling industries. So we have targeted that first from simply a, a visibility and a volume point of view. Um, but the, the, the fact is the, the majority of the waste really at this point is, is organics. Please proceed, ma'am. Okay. Um, you would have mentioned that you have intentions of rolling out the program in Tobago, but the transportation issues in terms of tr removing the waste to Trinidad for processing, for recycling. Um, have you tried partnering with any private entity in Tobago to see if that could be done on the island? Um, what, what we have done so far, we have, we have worked with a number of organizations, including NGOs and so on, and, and there are a number of, of initiatives happening now, which we, um, some of them we are involved in, some of them we are just aware of it. Uh, so there are some efforts to, um, to do recycling and, and to, to have innovative approaches towards uh, recycling in Tobago, but in the mainstream, it, it, um, until, until we get the program to a sustainable level, um, where there are volumes on a regular basis that can justify programs in Tobago itself, it, it will in fact have to, to come back to, to Trinidad. But I mean, notwithstanding the challenges, uh, you know, I do think we have a good plan going forward um, that, that is workable and, and sustainable. Member Bodo. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is just a follow-up question on the solar panels. And just to ask whether the Ministry or TNTEC um, would have done any survey or has any information as regards the number of citizens or households um, that are currently unable to access the electricity grid so as to provide a basis for, for the initial rollout of the solar panel program. Do we, do we have that information? I'll revert to Mr. Ramsukonis. Right, our records, while we still have to do further checks, is showing that we have a 98% coverage. Um, we feel a 2% could average about between 5,000 customers or thereabout um, throughout the length and breadth of both Trinidad and Tobago. And those are the, um, those are the ones that are really in a distance location that, that makes it a little difficult um, you know, to provide a service. It's costly if you have to provide the service and so on. And just one more follow-up question with regards to the public awareness campaign that was discussed earlier. And one of the items here would be the constituency sensitization program. And I note that um, the training sessions uh, have taken place at 13 constituency offices. Am I to understand that this is through the constituency office of the Member of Parliament? 
And, and secondly, if that is the case, can you indicate whether any further constituencies have been engaged uh, since that number that you gave in 2016? Yes, those um, constituency sensitization or training would have taken place with the Member of Parliament and the staff of these offices. And it is the intention of the Ministry to continue this constituency sensitization for fiscal 2018. And we also intend to include councillors as well as we go across Trinidad and Tobago. Just to provide an answer, can you say how many constituencies have been engaged to date? I would need to really go back and check. Can yes. you undertake to provide that in writing then? I will do that. Sir. Thank you. Yes. Member Mark. Um, as, a, as a monopoly provider of water, coming back to, T, to Wasa, I would like to suggest to the chair, to the permanent secretary, and to Mr. Boris, that WASA needs to be more sensitive and responsive to the cries and pleads of citizens when they communicate to WASA. If WASA continue, Madam Chair, to be cold and unresponsive, we are going to get more court cases. I read with alarm, shock, and almost trepidation in today's papers where court ordered WASA to pay two citizens from Iri Village because of leaks and complaints and non-response or responses coming from WASA to the tune of $2.2 million. And I was even more alarmed when I read that only last month an elderly couple, having made several complaints to WASA, and those complaints having, been, having fallen on deaf ears, they had to take WASA to court. And the court ordered WASA to pay that couple whose house was lost, like the previous couple, $1.1 million. This is a utility that depends on the taxpayers of this country for its survival. But I believe it's a monopoly provider. So could you explain to this committee Having regard to what we have been told, 50% of the water supplied is lost through leakage. What efforts are being made? Apart from this rapid response squad that we heard about, I don't know how rapid that response squad is, but I would like WASA to tell this committee one, what systems are they going to put in place to be more user-friendly when the citizenry complain and submit complaints about leakages in the system? Could you, could you let us know how you'll respond to that? Thank you, uh, member, and to the chair. Uh, WASA is suffering from age infrastructure. At least that was forgotten when uh, one of the former persons spoke about 
the challenges of WASA. WASA has aged infrastructure. And with aged infrastructure, you expect some level of leakage or breakage of pipes that have gone through their, 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 their useful life. We know that Maraval, I think it's 1853 uh, that the water system started in that area. And I don't know whether the lines have been changed out, but we have an age infrastructure that has, uh, that has significant uh, challenges, and therefore it will take approximately $3 billion as far as we discussed this morning, I want to be consistent with the figures, to change out the entire old infrastructure to get new infrastructure in and to set up a proper arrangement to capture the leaks that are there. We know in areas where we have, uh, like Singapore, Singapore has like 4.4% uh, of uh, non-revenue water. But here we, it is very high because infrastructure is very old and we really have to take a, 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 a scheduling out of whatsoever we have to change out so we're able to change it out in time or change it out before it gets worse. Um, the situation with respect to our customers, I know that its customers are very challenged, or challenge. at least we are all customers of WASA because WASA produces water from the president to the vagrant and therefore we have to really be mindful of our circumstances with respect to the delivery of water to the nation. However, because of our challenges, at which we all know, we have all been around to see water leaking here, water leaking there. It is, Wasai doesn't deliberately want water to leak out, no. Water leak out because there is an infrastructure problem. And we are putting in place the very necessary things at time. This rapid response arrangement, we have discussed with the union to take, bring on board some uh, shift arrangement to ensure that we deal rapidly with the, with the, with the challenges of Wasa. Some of the um, problems go, went well because we do not have the detection system to know the underground leakage because there, there are surface leakage and there are subterranean leakages. So we have to, we are, we are purchasing a machine really that we can able to detect the, the, under, the, the subterranean leaks uh, that is in process. Probably by next year we should have that, 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 that piece of equipment to detect those uh, underground leaks. But the challenges are there and they are, they are real. They are not, we, we cannot hide from them. We, we have an age infrastructure, we have to deal with that. I don't know how, the, and, the, and to add to it, the money is not there. However, uh, the, we, we are putting in place systems where we could able to, uh, the scatter system where we can able to identify our challenges early. So if a, a, a well is out of operation or whether we have a shutdown or a, a massive leakage on any of the major trunks or, or line or distribution mains, we can able to detect it early so we can able to lock down the various areas to prevent the leakages and also to inform our valuable customers uh, about the leak so they can able to conserve water to, to um, uh, uh, they can conserve the water so therefore uh, they, they can have some water when there is no water on the main because of our, our, our leak pro problems. Uh -huh. So we are, we are trying our best. We, we know that there are challenges everywhere and we know there is a financial challenge facing the country and uh, wheresoever we can do things that can able to augment change, we will do so. We um, will also... Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Sir. Um, Madam Chairman, could we get from the Permanent Secretary how many more court cases are pending in the high courts of this country where citizens, because of the insensitivity of WASA, when they complain, have to take their grievances to the courts and they are being given big, big awards. How many more cases are pending? That's the first area, Madam Chair. And what is WASA doing to be more responsive and sensitive to the population when they submit complaints about leakages that are impacting on their private spaces, which is their Homes, Madam Chair. Appears, uh, I, I, um, 
I just want to indicate that because, as I, as I indicated earlier, that some of the leaks, we are not aware of them. Those that are reported and that, are, that have come into the system, from the time I'm at Awasa, a few months ago, I know I move immediately, or I get the, the necessary personnel to move immediately to har arrest those leaks. So there may be uh, um, uh, more court, court cases which are, are pending, but I will submit that later. A member, if I, if I might, might, might just add, uh, I hear the concerns you have raised with citizens out there. It, I mean, we experience it every day. I mean, I myself driving about, I see a leak on two occasions. I took pictures of it. I called Dr. Boris, and they were fixed within very short space of time. Uh, so it's, it, it's something, as a citizen, it bothers one, because water is life. It's essential to life. And we must be aware of that. We have to understand the critical role we play at the ministry, and we will provide the support to WASA. Uh, there are a number of areas that WASA needs support on, besides the aging infrastructure. We, we have to look at the actual organization itself. There has to be transformation taking place within WASA. It cannot be business as usual. It, it just can't. And some of the deeper things we, it's going to take longer to fix when you look at the cultural change that needs to take place at WASA. So it's a transformation of whether it's, it's the organization, the right fit with people, but the hardest one to treat with is that cultural shift. They have been operating in such a way for so long, it's going to take some time. But I can assure you that we are committed to doing that because I would always say at the ministry, what is the vision we have in going forward? What is the vision? The vision has to be, and the Ministry of Public Utilities is well cited to affect the lives of every single person in Trinidad and Tobago. That's a tremendous responsibility on our shoulders, and we have to accept that responsibility. What do we see our country as in going forward? What is the legacy we're going to leave for our children? It must be better services with water, electricity, telecommunication, etc. So when I speak like this, I'm very passionate about it because I want to make a difference. Like I told all the members of staff when I came there, I'm not a technical expert in all of the things that you do, you know. But my purpose there is to ensure that there is that vision in serving Trinidad and Tobago. And we have to accept that as public officers. And I am certain on this side at the ministry and with the agencies under our purview, there has to be a change and we're going to work with them to ensure that the changes take place. It may not be at the speed that we would hope for, but certainly at the end of the day, we must be able to better the lives of our citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So, I certainly share the concerns you have raised, member, and we will continue to work with WASA to try and treat with those areas. There, there has to be some innovation taking place given the circumstances that we are currently faced, but I am certain with the, with the officers at the agencies and the ministry, something could happen as it relates to innovation. Madam Chair, if you would permit me to um, direct this question to SwimCon. We understand that through the PS via the chair that the ministry is promoting swim call to undertake the role and function of a waste recycling management authority. First of all, could you share with us if that is a fact? And what would be the function or functions of this new authority? And how would it benefit Trinidad and Tobago? 
Could you help us? Afternoon again. Um, certainly it's a fact, um, yes, that, that has been agreed to that uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Solid Waste Management Company would fulfill the duties of a waste recycling authority. As I would have explained before, um, we live on an island state and we generate a lot of waste, um, plastic packaging in particular, uh, but all the other types of waste as well. Um, one of the attributes of our waste management system is that for the average citizen, waste uh, disposal is free and therefore we have no thought as to uh, how much waste we generate um, as applicable as it is to citizens it's it's more applicable to businesses and so because for them waste disposal is all is, is also free and therefore there there's no there's no thought at all and therefore we have an urgent need to reduce that amount of waste and and one of the best ways and easiest ways to reduce that waste is in fact through recycling. It's estimated that about 70% of the waste that is generated in the country is in fact recyclable and therefore we have to make, you know, make, take advantage of that. So the, the intention of uh, having us fulfill the duties of the Waste Management Authority is that waste already comes to us and therefore it should be our prime responsibility to ensure that um, that we can, in fact, recycle and reduce the amount of waste that requires final disposal. Um, disposal is a cost no matter what, what system you use, whether it's, it's landfilling as we do right now, or whether you want to go to waste energy, and so it is a cost. And recycling sometimes is a cost as well, but usually the recycling costs are less than the disposal costs. And that's, that's essentially the essence behind the move towards uh, uh, the, the, the waste recycling. Uh, management authority and, um, and we are working with the ministry now to put the systems and, 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 uh, and put everything in place, the mechanisms in place to, um, to fulfill that function. Would, the, would, the, would that um, authority replace your company, SwimCon? Right, basically the mandate is to fulfill the functions of a waste recycling authority. It doesn't mean that SwimCall necessarily will become a waste recycling authority. We'll still continue to exist as SwimCall whilst we fulfill those functions. So some of those functions involve um, setting up uh, programs and uh, um, facilities like the, the, the beverage container, um, recyclable, uh, act and, and so forth. So, so we will be the focal point in, in terms of getting uh, those, those programs off the ground. So uh, beverage containers is, is one aspect, but we also have the, the issue with tires, we also have the issue with e-waste, and so those are the, uh, the, the focal areas that we will be looking at um, with a view to recycling and reduction. Any, um, any time frame for the coming into being of this management Recycling Authority. Uh, remember, I think we, just to add some clarity, as uh, Mr. Roach had indicated, it's the functions of the authority. So I, I, I just want to add that clarity. Right, in terms of the time frame, we, we work closely with the ministry now and with the Attorney General. Um, the, uh, in terms of the legislative aspect, and so I know we're looking at the first quarter of 20, of calendar year 2018. Um, I stand to be corrected by, by, by the ministry itself, but that's the time frame that, that currently we are working with. All right, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Pierce, I just want to change the focus a bit. And, um, look at some of the matters and recommendations and your own undertakings under the two previous reports. So that in terms of the third report of this committee, uh, one of the recommendations dealt with your inventory register. And in a letter of the 30th of June, 2017, to the secretary of this committee, your ministry indicated that the inventory exercise was expected to be completed by mid-June 2017. Was that done?
Uh, that activity has been completed. In, and has that, has, therefore, have all the, have you therefore inputted all that information into inventory register? Uh, just uh, a correction there, the information will be uploaded in December. What we have in fact completed is the tagging of all the uh, items. So you've actually, so let's deal with one thing. You have not as yet updated your register, the inventory. It's the physical register has been completed. The electronic register would be updated in December. And has there been any audit of the register? Not at this point in time. When is one likely to take place? I was told that it would be completed by the end of this month. So it will be completed by the end of this De month. December. So that we can say that by January you'd be in a position to um, give us a status on that and the results of that audit. Yes. Now, as far as the tagging, my understanding is that there was some delay in the tagging exercise because of the type of tagging that was done. Uh, that may have been so, but I'm advised that the tagging has, has been completed. It's been completed? Yes. When was it complete? June 30th. Uh, June 30th, 2017. And can I ask what kinds of tags that were used? Was it an electronic tagging system or a label that can be removed? It was a, it was a label. A label? Yes. And therefore, the tagging exercise haven't been completed in June. Has there been any, because if it's a label, it's something that can be easily removed. Also, has there been any verification or what is the plan for verification of your items that have been tagged and the existence of the tags? Audit would have been doing the verification exercise. Uh, what, what I will add as well to, uh, in terms of monitoring what takes place, uh, we currently have CCTV cameras installed in the ministry along certain the floors. So that is also uh, a security measure if one would want to look at it that way. So, but. Uh, the tagging, the verification has going on this week, yes. So that you can, you have the surveillance system, you have, uh, so that will talk with respect to movement. Is that checked? And is checked how often? By whom? Who's actually responsible for monitoring your electronic surveillance system? Uh, certainly during the day, um, the CCTV is monitored by our security on site, MTS, uh, but it also monitored by IT as well. In your assets and stores, all your assets and all your stores have been tagged. And you said that is as of the 30th of June? Yes. Yes, okay. Oh. Let me ask something with respect to rental. You, if I understood your move to Alexander, one Alexander place took place only as recently as September of this year. Are there executed leases? Uh, not at this point in time. Um, what is the process and how long would you have an executed lease?
Uh, that activity is conducted by the Property and Real Estate Services Division, uh, and we don't have a time frame for that. Um, in terms of your allocation for rent, accommodation, and storage, would I be correct in saying that last year your, you would have exceeded your budget, last fiscal? Would I be correct in saying that? Uh, yes. And that would be by how much? Okay, so can I ask then, how would that um, deficit be met? Or how was it intended to be met? So for fiscal... Oh, so, sorry, um, generally we would have we would need to have a conversation with the Ministry of Finance uh, in, in terms of having an allocation. Let me ask this. In terms of fiscal 2017-2018, is your allocation for rent and storage in line with what your commitments to your landlords for a year? 2017-2018. Uh, I will have to check on that and revert to you on that, Madam Chair. So in terms of having got your, your, your budget approved, would I be correct in saying that certainly in terms of rent, you don't know what your variance is likely to be? Uh, we would know, but like I said, we just would need to provide that to you. I, we didn't work with that information, but it certainly could be provided to you in writing. Okay, and let me ask one other thing. Having moved to one, Alexander, please. Is your annual rent for fiscal 2017, 2018 likely to be more than your annual rent for 20, fiscal 2016, fiscal 2017. Um, Madam Chair, to you, um, given that we would have moved into, we would have taken up residence in Alexandria Place on the 15th, somewhere between the 9th and the 15th of September, it would have meant that fiscal 16, 17, we would have been at this same value in terms of rent as we would be for 1718. Um, during fiscal 1516, oh, yes. No, no. During fiscal, I just we did compare it more, this year with last year. It should be the same amount of rent. There's no increase. So there's no increase in your rental liability between last fiscal year and this current fiscal year, having taken up different accommodation. Our date for taking up accommodation in one Alexandria place was September 15th, 2016. So that from 1st October 2016 to 17, that rent was fixed, which is the current rent. So it's the same. The same. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that, and therefore, then if, because my understanding was that you only took up this year. But seeing it was last September, therefore, what was the delay in your inventory exercise and the tagging? Because it couldn't be removed, you would have already been there. Uh, 
Uh, part of the de delay would have involved the realignment with the ministry and our the ministry water resources. Part of it, because I think I'm being told that uh, items would have been coming across from there. So part of the delay would have resulted from that realignment. That, that wasn't given as an explanation at all to us before. See, we have a written submission from you on the 30th of June, and that is not part of that explanation. Inform that it's in the January submission. Yeah. All right, Dr. Bodo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, P.S. if I may refer you to the ministerial response to the first um, report of the PAAC and with regards to the recommendation that the ministry mandates was to prepare a fraud policy with specific reference to prevent the preparation and issuing of fraudulent checks at WASA. This policy must be approved by the board for implementation by December 2016. And the response states that the WASA and sewage authority has an anti-fraud policy mm -hmm. that was approved by their board on February 10, 2015 and a copy is appended. Um, but this is in specific reference to the fact um, that there were 67 fraudulent checks reported missing in 2016. So the question that follows um, would be, uh, when was this policy actually implemented? Okay. Uh, Dr. Boris, I'll revert to you. Uh, to, uh, remember, um, uh, 2015 was the time, was the year it was, it was introduced, policy. Can you then explain whether um, this policy would have been in place when these checks were prepared and whether the, the policy was referred to? From my understanding of this situation, uh, the Checks were, uh, there were, there were systems in place and the internal audit department um, did investigation and uh, act, uh, uh, recommended some uh, changes to be uh, implemented to ensure the fraudulent checks do not reappear. But as far as I also learned that the fraudulent checks were not from the Water and Sewage Authority, they were generated outside of the Water and Sewage Authority. So can you give us an update as to where this matter has reached, a status update? Well, at, at present, we, we are going to, we have a new check writing machine that, um, well, all the other necessary things are relating to security of checks and a strong room to put uh, checks into with the, with the necessary um, vaults uh, in place. And we now have a, a check writing machine that has to be customized with respect to the signatures that are to be on the checks. So it, we are in process of finalizing the arrangements to ensure that there is a non-recurrence of the circumstances that took place prior. So can you, can you tell us, uh, can you tell the people of Trinidad and Tobago how confident you are that this will not occur in the future in terms of what you have put in place? From my knowledge and confidence, I, am, I can assure the nation that such will not reoccur because we have put the necessary and correct um, instrument in place. Are you, are you therefore saying that no employee of WASA was actually implicated in, the, uh, in, in this issue in terms of the checks? In, uh, no, as far as I know, no, no sir. No one was implicated. It, sorry, is this a matter of a police investigation? That's what I'm asking it. Yes, it, and uh, it's, it's the first court is dealing with the matter. At Member Ma. Um, Permanent Secretary, um, just Personal? clear uh, please. here for us um, on the question of one Alexandra. Uh, is, that, is it Alexander? 
Alexander Place. What is the current monthly rental in value terms? It's uh, 675000 but inclusive. And where you were before on Elizabeth Street, what was the annual, the monthly rental monthly. you all paid in? Elizabeth Street. Uh, we'll get that information to you, member, in writing. In I writing. don't have that. All right, let, let me go to the third report mm -hmm. on inventory control and your undertaking to the parliament. Um, I want to deal with the economic infrastructure, fuel and energy, 00305, electricity. The National Street Lighting Program. Could you share with us how many street lights were erected for fiscal 2017? And further, in which areas were these street lights erected? I'll revert to our senior project manager to respond. Um, to the chair, a total of 1,155 new and upgraded street lights were installed for the period October um, 2016 to September 2017. Um, 246 um, lamp installations have also been completed. 494 poles have been installed for that corresponding period, and they were installed throughout Trinidad and Tobago. No, I, 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 I didn't ask for, I know it is installed throughout Trinidad and Tobago, that's a fact. Um, could you give us a detailed breakdown of location? If Where you these like street locations, lights? Provide. Yes, we will you, provide you could that provide us in writing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. On the electrification program, five nine seven. Could you first of all provide details on the scope of this program? What is the current status of this electrification program? And what accounts for the increase in allocation? for the month ending July of 2017. I believe you're speaking to decrease in allocation, the well, electrification I, I, program. Well, you, it may be a decrease, we have it as an increase, but you may advise us um, otherwise. The electrification program is aimed at expanding the national grid to <coughs> underserved and unserved areas. Um, it responds to a need that could not be done in-house. It includes the installation of wires and poles or electrical infrastructure. <clears throat> we like to distinguish between two of our programs, the Residential Electrification Assistance Program and the, electrif sorry, the Electrification Program in two different ways. The Residential Electrification Program goes from your meter to inside of your house, and the electrification program goes from the road to your meter base, which is poles and wires. Um, the normal procedure is that someone would apply, there's an application. Um, included with the application, you are required to have a, excuse me, <coughs> TN Tech capital contribution letter which speaks to the amount the installation would cost. Persons must have legitimate tenure to the property on which they seek to get the infrastructure. We will not install in housing developments, privately owned, et cetera. And this is what we do. Um, once the applications have come in, excuse me, <coughs> once the applications have come in, um, members of staff of the sectoral programs and projects unit conduct site visits where pictures are taken and an assessment is done. These are packaged and go before the technical advisory committee, which is chaired by the permanent secretary and their group of technocrats of the ministry that will make a determination of recommendation or non-recommendation to the office of the minister. 
for approval. And that's the normal process. Could you tell us how much money would have been allocated for this program in fiscal 2017? And how many um, residents, um, how many persons um, having the necessary documentation, as you have said, uh, would have benefited from that electrification program in fiscal 2017? And could you give us a breakdown of the location of the areas? I'll be able to provide the <coughs> location for you in writing. Um, this year, there were 40 jobs that were approved during, well, during fiscal, I'm sorry, that were completed during fiscal 2017 and an additional 28 jobs from previous approvals that would have been completed. Sometimes, depending on when the approval is done, the approval may be done in one fiscal, but the works are actually done in another fiscal. So I just want you to be able to capture that. So last year, we would have done 68 jobs. The total was $2.3 million. Um, the allocation was $2 million, but once again, we were utilizing funds that were on hand in TNTech, so we had to make no drawdown against our allocation. And what do you anticipate for 2018? Do you have a projection? Yes. And what is the allocation? The allocation in 2018 is $0. Right? I'm just smiling because we have funds on hand. So you just forgive me for saying that and smiling. But our intent is to do, I believe, 105. I just want to get the correct number. Yes, we expect to do 100 projects in fiscal 2018 utilizing funds on hand from previous year's balances. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, and, and therefore maybe you could really help us, Ms. Mrs. Johnson Lawrence. In terms of this, the electrification program you're talking about is 597? 593. 593. So according to you, under 593, you would have got no, allocate, no allocation this year. All right. Now let me ask you, this, this fund that has been used from year to year, what is the current quantum in the fund? At present, there's $6.6 .6 million um, that are on hand. on hand. But I would be able to give you an exact figure um, in writing. All because right. it, it, it could vary. All right. And when I say could vary, um, it could vary in terms of depending on when we do an approval and the works are actually done. We would have even had a situation where we would have had um, an increase in the balance when the adjustment was made for value added tax when VAT went down because these jobs include VAT. So when VAT went down from 15% to 12.5%, we would have ended up being having excess funds. Okay. All right. So let me see if I understand. This fund is not growing. This fund is not growing. It's not being fed <coughs> by any source. The fund is not growing. No. Okay. You may have an actual balance on the fund, which may be um, better than what your projected balance would have been. That's what you're trying to explain? Yes. So, all right, but the fund is not growing. Yes. What you said is since about 2014, you've been using this fund against 581, 583, 585, 591, and 593. Correct. Are those, do, do, those are all. Okay? So that I'm going back and I'm trying to look at what your statement was for July 2017. I've since got September 17, and I now have October um, 2017, okay? So let's say, for instance, in July of 2017, if you have that statement, your revised provision, which would have been what your allocation was in 2017, would be a, a million. You would have done work, but you didn't have to touch your allocation 
because you would have been drawing from your fund. Correct. Okay? So that when you tell us your projections at the end of July is two million, would I be correct to say that you projected you would have expended two million out of the fund and still not touch your allocation? That's correct. Right. What you're telling us in variance, what is that? When I look at the expenditure sheet. No, no, uh, yeah. Variance is column eight. What does variance show? Could you? Chair, I'd like to pass that over to the um, accounting executive one yes. because they would prepare that estimate, that um, expenditure statement. Okay, so let me just ask one thing before you pass it. So, Mr. Permanent Secretary, did you have sight of these, these documents which were submitted? I know you said the senior management team is new. I can't remember exactly what date you got there, but did you have sight of these at all? I would have seen the document just before they came to you. Gotcha. Um, and you would have seen them to prepare for today, I expect. You would have seen them to prepare for today, for today's hearing. I'd expect so. Yes. Yes? Okay. So if somebody could explain to the committee what the variance column is about, I think it would help us tremendously in understanding these If we could start at looking at the one in July 2017. Madam Chair, we would have to take a look at again at that document before. Well, you see, yeah. I, I, I'll tell you something. The difficulty I'm having is this. We've asked for these statements for a particular purpose. And it seems that none of us on either side could decipher this. Let's just look at 597 in your July statement. Okay, you have a revised provision of 40,000. 40 million, sorry. If I understand well, this is not in that fund. Okay, good. You have an actual, I think that must be received even though it's looking like related, but I would take it as received to date of 40 million. You have expenditure to June 2017, 40 million. So I will expect you have zero if my maths is correct. You have commitments as zero. Then you have projections at the end of July as 65 million, and you have a variance as a positive 25 million. So, so unless, I can't see these statements being prepared, and we only deal with July. We only deal with July. Let me carry it to September. We have computerized programs doing these things in public utilities. Mr. Piaz? Yes. Okay. Now, my understanding is August would be in the same fiscal, September would be in the same fiscal year as July. Agreed? Yes. Okay. 581. Your revised provision is now zero. When? In July it was a million. Okay, you still end up with a variance of two million. Okay, if you look now at your electrification 597, which is not any fund, 
your actual, your revised provision is now 57.2 million. But this is after the media review. So I could have understood if the figure of 40 million was before the media review. And then I'm looking at September, which is after the media review, so I could see you got more funds. And you end up now with, to the end of September, 80 million, and with a positive variance of 40 million. So, I mean, this is not just a question of looking at this. I mean, I would think anybody who looked at this or prepared this, it would jump out of them. Okay, let's go on, and maybe postal services could help you. 005-03-15. refurbishment and construction. In July, it says your revised provision was five million. In September, the same fiscal year, you know, tell them it's $359,780. And you end up with a projection at the end of September as three million and a positive variance of, variance of three million. So that, and you know, I've, I've just only taken some as examples. Okay, if you go through all of them, I, I mean, unless there is something that is not being explained, my limited mathematics can't reconcile them at all. I'm chair through you. I believe that the error is being made in that coming close to the end of the fiscal year, as is normal when we will not be expending funds, there would have been a series of requests for violence and transfers that would have been had. And I think that that is where you're seeing these variances coming and, up. And it's precisely that that we want to track. Mm -hmm. And this does not allow us to do it. I agree. This is the precise reason why the committee has been asking for this. And it, it leads one to certain conclusions that one doesn't want to, to come to. We understand. And I can't believe that you all were prepared to come to a meeting because we didn't know that we didn't know we had the documents. And I know a call was placed to you all, and we were told, yeah, well, you have it. Nobody in check. It's the spikes that we want to check, I'm telling you. Okay, so let's go on. We now in 2010, um, 2018. Might I ask, the same project, refurbishment and construction, postal services, is that complete? No, Madam Chair, through you. It's not completed? No, there was What not are the completed. plans for it in fiscal 2018? Mm -hmm. um, the intent in fiscal 2018 is to reconstruct the building um, the TT Post building at Sandy Grandi, to reconstruct the building at Rio Claro, and to repair the compound in Gasparillo, as well as to do roof repairs in Santa Cruz. Okay. Those plans were prior to the passage of the budget? Those plans that you intend to repair, was yes. that prior to the budget that was passed in October 20? Yes. Do you have funds to carry out those plans? Yes. Where would those funds come from? Uh, in fiscal 15, 16, $5 million was released to TT Post under the refurbishment and construction after they had closed a tender and had engaged project management services of National Self-Help Commission to finish the plans and the approvals to rebuild Newtown and some other postal offices. Okay. They never received approvals and they withdrew the tender and started the process over again. Okay, so from what, you, what I was told to me on the economic infrastructure, fuel and energy, electricity, and on the postal services, um, 
I would want to conclude that there are funds available to the ministry and other agencies of the ministry outside of what has been appropriated in any fiscal year. On the specific um, yes. headings, yes. Okay. Where does the accounting occur for that? The agencies provide those that information in terms of funds held on account from their financial, from their expenditure and income statements on a monthly basis. It is cross-checked with what we know we have released, and we do a reconciliation exercise on a monthly basis with our agencies. Is that at all submitted to Parliament? No. Might I ask why? I don't have an answer. Might I ask why, Mr. P.S.? Chair, I, I don't have an answer to that question as well. I would think as the P.S. you would. Is that proper? Um, with respect to those funds that are on hand at our last meeting when we were here last year on, in May, we would have provided to the committee a breakdown. All our agencies would have provided to the committee a breakdown of all funds that were released against particular projects that were still on hand um, over a period of time. So that information has been provided. What we did not do is that if the agencies do not have all of their paperwork and approvals and these kinds of things. We will not allow them to spend the funds so that we sit tight, or I should say we, we monitor them closely. So that what you would find is that if they haven't finished all of their plans, if they haven't gotten all of their approvals, they certainly cannot spend the funds which were earmarked for something in particular. And at the end of the fiscal year, you're authorized to keep those monies that have not been spent? The issue with those cases is that those funds are not in the ministry. Those funds are actually at the agencies in their accounts. And are the agencies authorized to keep it at the end of the fiscal year? And does the ministry, or what is the role of the ministry, what is the role of the PS in assuring that at the end of the year, there's any sort of reporting of those, I, 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 don't, I don't know what even to describe them. And let's say those unspent monies that were properly allocated to specific projects. Uh, Chair, I, I wouldn't want to speak without understanding what is taking place. Uh, I would need to have a, an appraisal of, of, of what is taking place before. I want to ask you one question, um, P.S., because you, you are new here. When did you come again? Sorry? When did you come to this ministry? Uh, October. Of this year? Yeah. Did you know about these other source of funds? I know of some of the projects uh, where there wasn't any allocation in fiscal 2018. I was informed that uh, work would have been conducted using previous year balances. So it seems- You would have known us as far back as, say, 2015, 2014. I uh, know. Oh. So could we, therefore, ask for an investigation with respect to these other sources under the various allocations, what is the approval, what is the source of approval for the agency to, to keep it and use it however otherwise? Um, can I ask also that the expenditure statements for September, July, August, September be redone and maybe we can get them by the 29th of December And if there are violence, what, um, you know, the proof of the violence and, and the authority under which it was done. 
And can I ask if the ministry has submitted to the Ministry of Finance the quarterly report for this quarter's allocation? It was submitted. And could we kindly get a copy, please? I have one other question, um, P.S. Um, this is to concerning WASA. And again, um, integrity of records and assets and so on. It was uh, in the public domain that WASA headquarters experienced a fire in January 2016. So that um, the committee would like to know, in terms of safeguarding its records, what systems are in place to secure the records, having regard to that experience, as far as WASA. I can ask Dr. Boris to respond. Let's uh, for the benefit, I, I, I wanted to finish the answering of the fraudulent checks issue, and then I will answer the other. The, with respect to the fraudulent checks, I just want to make sure that for the benefit of the nation, that two persons were charged by the police, persons who are not employed at the Water and Sewage Authority, and that the bank, RBC has refunded WASA in full for the money that was re re related to those fraud fraudulent checks. Yeah, that's how much money. Ask how much money that was again, please. I, I'm not sure the figure, but I, I think it's about 400, and, uh, 400, 400 plus thousand. I don't have the exact, but I could give you that later. As of what date was the refund made? Yeah, we will provide that, um, um, Chair. Right, and much. pertaining to the records and the burning of the building, um, I have learned that um, the records have been moved off the compound to a safe place, and because of, uh, uh, well, you don't want to release where the information is in the public, so we will pro provide that after. So what you're saying is there's off-site storage? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and that will suffice. Okay. Um, might I ask the T and Tech, and, and this comes, Mr. P.S., through our visit to the TGU plant and the submission um, made in response to some of our recommendations. Um, Tian Tech had indicated that there are a certain risk um, which will naturally flow from their reliance, their increased reliance on Trinidad um, Generation Unlimited. And one of the risks they identified was that there would be small pockets of load shedding should any of the steam turbines at TGU trip. I wanted to ask because a lot of uh, areas suffer from time to time outages. In a day, sometimes you have two, three outages of maybe an hour, 15, 20 minutes. Is this this sort of situation that TN Tech is referring to here? Uh, Mr. Ramsu, I'll revert. Right, Chairman, okay, so the first thing is that you would have recalled in the last meeting the TGU issue came up and the issue of the pneumatic system failing and that caused an island-wide shutdown. Mm -hmm. That we, we would have had interaction as the agency that supplies the power to the nation. Um, we would have had interaction with TGU. They have since resolved that and, and put in redundancies. They have put in an additional compressor, diesel compressor, as well as um, um, other facilities to safeguard that situation from occurring. The point is, beyond that time, um, we would have hardly had as much incident from TGU affecting the, the, the supply to the country. So those areas that you would be speaking about generally would be pockets that, as a result of either um, unplanned faults, 
um, be it um, be it vehicle making contact with poles, be it a failure of a component on the infrastructure that would have caused those outages. Um, certainly, we continue to look at the entire system to make sure that we reduce the outages. Records are showing that we're getting better, but certainly we're not there yet. Right, so th that is definitely the situation with us. But I can tell you, the plant has settled down. Um, the plant has settled down. We are in the last phase um, of trying to get um, a last portion of the capacity out of TGU. We can get at this point in time 600 megawatts, very comfortable now. That's what we do, and we have another 120, and we in that last segment to get the final capacity out of TGU. Thank you. And in terms of again trying to minimize. Um, your risk. You said that there was supposed to be a substation, You're supposed to invest in your substation at Gandhi Village with some, some sort of transformer, um, which is expected to be completed in 2018. Could you tell us what is the status of that? Right. So at Gandhi Village substation, at Gandhi Village substation, the transformer was in fact installed and fully commissioned at Gandhi of March of this um, of 2017. Um, so Gandhi Village is fully complemented with two um, transformers um, with capacity to supply the infrastructure, the, the, the country. So the only remaining issue now in that particular um, job and that particular project is to finish one more double circuit line that leaves the Union substation right down in Labre and comes to Gandhi. And that's the last phase of that project. And that, that is expected to be completed? At right? the end of, well, we, 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 we're trying our best for the end of 2018. Um, it seems like it will shift to a bit of 2017. The, the tender has already been closed and assessed and so on, and we are just trying to work out the log final logistics with the land for that portion, really. So the end of 2018? Uh, we feel by the first quarter, um, uh, at best end of 2018, or it could shift uh, just by the first quarter of 2019. Okay, and what sort of risk are uh, we exposed to in terms of your delivery of service to the customer with we this one outstanding um, project from Union? Right, there are no risks to the customers. The capacity, available capacity of this country, other than the peak demand, is 400 megawatts. So it's additional capacity. The, the issue really is to try to get the final capacity out of TGU because of the savings in gas. Mm -hmm. Once you can up get the full capacity out of TGU. I would dare say, though, that we, um, you know, our, our reliability department, while, while we really want, you know, when we complete our project, fine, the 720 will be fully available. Engineering-wise, Chairman, um, we, 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 we will also want to be a little careful in supplying all the time full capacity from one location, and that is at, at, at 720 megawatts. Certainly, it will, be, it will be available, as I said, it, it is good for 600 comfortably now. 720 means that you're now supplying capacity of one end, which is library, coming northwards to the country. Should you have a loss of supply from that section, you could affect the country. So we are looking, we, 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 the way the system is dynamically connected. So we look at the entire system, but certainly it is a project we will complete. Um, as I say, at this point in time, there's adequate capacity um, throughout the, the, the grid from the various uh, producers, the IPPs on the grid. Okay, thank you very much. Member Mark. Yes. Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I just, would like to refer to the utilities um, assistant, assistance program rather, and to deal specifically out of the first report, ministerial response, given the submission that we had made to parliament. And I refer specifically to the water tank assistance along with the solar panel assistance. And we are supposed to be receiving, given how this program is supposed to be monitored, what is called a post-evaluation exercise on the beneficiaries of the program and to conduct site visits 
and to provide us with an appreciation of how often these site visits would have been conducted and what was the number of beneficiaries for the period up to July of 2017. Would, would you have any information on that, um, Mr. Permanent Secretary? I will just ask Ms. Speakers to respond. Member Mark, for the period, for the fiscal 2017 period, the SOWI would have completed six solar panel projects under the UAP. And under the provision of water tanks, we would have provided 35 water tanks to low income families. Site visits are conducted to every applicant and that is before they are approved for assistance. The report would then be submitted to our technical advisory committee, which is chaired by the permanent secretary, and approval, which is based on, based on approval, recommendation of that committee, sorry, the minister would then grant approval for implementation. The ministry has in place, however, a monitoring framework where site visits are conducted by the monitoring and evaluation unit and they would do sporadic visits to some of these applicants and in that case those persons would be now beneficiary and um, a report would be submitted to the permanent secretary. In addition, the internal audit unit has also been conducting site visits pre and post in order to ensure that the process itself is being followed. So it is being done. So we're talking about essentially about 35 persons, persons benefited. receiving the water tank and six persons would have received the solar panel projects as at the end of 2017. That would be for that fiscal. The, yes. water, the, 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 sizes, the sizes of the tanks would be about 800 six, gallon. 600 gallon for household beneficiaries and 800 gallon for community facilities. Yes. Member okay. right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's with regards to the UAP, the Utility Assistance Program, and the intention to have the um, Ministry of Public Utilities Services on TT Connect. And I know that you had an MOU developed in fiscal 2016, and you faced some challenges. Can you give us an update as to what is the status of this MOU? Um, so in terms of creating the connecting to the TT Connect platform? At this time, we must report that the MOU still has not been finalized and the ministry's services are not yet available on the, on the TT Connect platform. However, it is something that we are still pursuing with iGov TT and TT Connect. Can you explain to this committee what are the challenges you are facing in view of the fact that you know this kind of public accessibility or access would be critical for these services? Based on my information from TT Connect, they would have been working out first and foremost the transition from iGov at one point and following that they would have been detailing things like the service level agreement, the frequency of service, um, who would be the liaison, so this would be internal administrative matters that would be addressed by TT Connect. Do you have an, any indication at all as to when this might become a reality? Well, it is projected that it should be in fiscal 2018, but again, we have to depend on the liaising between ourselves and TT Connect. Okay. Uh, okay, um, Mr. Pierce, I just want us to look at your the current expenditure um, budget 2018 and the statement 31st October 2017. And I'm looking here goods and services 0208 rent lease office accommodation and storage. Where I'm seeing that your Allocation, your approval allocation is 8.4 million. Yes, the current expenditure budget 2018.
So I'd be correct in saying that your allocation is 8.4 million? Your, your rentals are due on what date of the month? Beginning of the month, Madam Chair. All right. So at the end of October, you would not have paid any of the rent due for any of your accommodation. So this $750,000, that would have been carried over from the previous fiscal year? Commitment, yes, it would have been something that would have been carried over. Could you give us a breakdown with respect to um, which facilities this related to? And also give us a breakdown with respect to whether it would have cleared all your outstanding commitments as of end of fiscal 2017. And if not, what? is the extent of the outstanding commitment. I'm sure we'll provide that information in writing to you. Um, what interests me also is 28 other contracted services. And it interests me because I saw like uh, Member Mark, a very interesting article, today's papers, that you owe $1 billion to contractors. Yeah, well, Wasser, is, isn't Wasser reporting to the Ministry of Finance? Yes? Isn't they reporting to the Ministry of Public Utilities? Okay, so that that would not be paid under on the, on the contracted services 28, would it? Um, no, um, Madam Chair, this is for the ministry itself. Huh? Yes. yes. Okay, but the one billion that Wasa owes would not be paid under this. No. This is for you alone. Yes. Okay, so that this six. It would I be correct in saying for out of your current allocation, you spent six thousand for the month of October. Okay. Yes. And these commitments, the twenty-six thousand two hundred fifty dollars, would have been for maybe the previous fiscal year. Yes, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, could you see if this would have cleared off all your commitments for as of fiscal twenty seventeen? Uh, we will provide that in writing together with the 750, Madam Chair. Yes, but you'll do it in the same way, please, in terms of letting us know. If not, what are your commitments still and the details? And of course, a plan with respect to how you're going to deal with all of this to live within the confines of your allocation. Okay, and in terms of WASA and that billion dollars that I've seen in the newspaper as owed to contractors, would that be a correct statement of the indebtedness? Of the total indebtedness? <laughs> no, to contractors. <laughs> I'll just ask Dr. Barrett to um, clarify. Uh, Yes, Chair, well, I didn't get a chance to look at the newspaper today, but we do, uh, owe, but I don't know the fig exact figure, but since I'm there, there have been agitation by the contractors that we owe, and we look at uh, some of the uh, aged bills that we have, and we do owe contractors a very a uh, hefty sum, which is probably near to a billion dollars. It is about probably 700 and about 700, uh, 700 million. But um, we have to verify 
because a lot, many of them might be claiming that we owe them, but their bills are not are not um, valid. Some of them. Okay. So, so we are we are we are verifying the bills that they may have submitted. Some of them don't have dates. We're not going to pay those. So there are a lot of things that we are checking and ensuring that we do the right thing. So you have a verification exercise going on? Yes, yes. Could you give us an idea of when that will be completed? Uh, yes, I will give you that in writing. And, and therefore, also along with, in terms of saying what sums you admit that yes. you're indebted to, yes. what would be your strategy for settling the indebtedness within the confines of what yes, Chair. your budget is and also in, within your mandate okay. to, of delivery of service to the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Okay, Chair. Member Mark. Um, P.S., could you um, advise this committee what is the period of the lease rental arrangement between the Ministry of Public Utilities and the, um, the owners of that property at one Alexander Place? Well, what's the period of the lease? Is it three years? They don't have a lease. Generally, the lease uh, should be three years. Like I said earlier, uh, that matter. They don't have a lease. That matter is with uh, Property and Real Estate Services Division. But a lease tends generally to be for three okay, years. So um, I would like to bring this meeting to an end. I want to thank the Acting Permanent Secretary, Mr. Joseph, and his team, and the representatives of the Ministry, representatives of WASA, Swim Call, uh, TT Post, T and Tech, and the RIC. I hope I've covered everybody. And if I haven't, um, I apologize, but we want to thank you all for coming and assisting us to bring some sort of um, clarification to some of the issues that we've seen. Um, we do expect that the undertakings to provide um, certain responses in writing, we would really like that we can get them by the 29th of December um, 2017. I want to thank the members of the listening public who have gone along with us, who've sent in questions and, and assisted the committee. And I want to thank the members of the media who have attended. I want to wish you all a safe journey home, and um, it's unlikely that the committee would see you all again before Christmas. I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas and best wishes for 2018. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs>